complexities that have gone with that, even up to this day, <laughs> including T one ninety, right? <laughs> yes. Well, I'll, uh, I don't, I'm not going to go into too much of detail of T one ninety. Well, uh, as a thing, but we can talk about that in the debate and that. Um, uh -huh. Can everyone? Can you see those slides, Mike? Dale, yeah. Those slides? Yeah, you're good. You're good. Nice one. Um, I'll make a start then, and uh, people can join us for going. Right, uh, evening everyone. Uh, as Mike said, for those who don't know me, I'm uh, Carl King. I'm one of the senior, I'm quite a mouthful my job title. I'm a senior principal systems engineer uh, at Jacobs. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a child engineer with the Institute of Engineering Technology here in the UK. And I'm also a certified systems engineering professional within Corsi. And in Corsi, I'm a member of both the, the UK Railway Interest Group and the Transportation Working Group. I've got nearly uh, uh, 20 years experience in the industry now. Uh, please don't hold that against me. Uh, predominantly, it's been in uh, this, what we call in the UK, the command and control and signaling sphere, which I'm gonna go into in a bit more in a minute. Uh, I started with London Underground, uh, as well as have worked on the main line in the UK, supporting ERTMS, which I'll be talking about in this lecture. Uh, I've also worked for Siemens in my time, and I've got more than seven years experience as in consultancy, including, the head, including as the head of train control systems technology for Mott McDonald. So I've been around a bit. And as Mike said, I'm currently one of the principal systems engineers at, on East West Rail. Uh, I'm mainly there looking after standards at the moment, but I'm also supporting uh, requirements and particularly working on the wider systems architecture. This is actually a presentation, I'll just full disclosure. Uh, this is actually a repeat of a presentation I gave for a, uh, a, a wider, uh, a, a wider um, <clears throat> a seminar that was run by Waterfront here in the UK earlier this year, which was all completely on ERTMS. Uh, and the brief I was given for that was to look at the challenges of integrating different systems, particularly of how we can integrate things like automatic train operation and communications based train control uh, with systems like ETCS. And what are the best, the best practice for integration of these different systems? And how do these systems interface and work together? So in this presentation, I'll do a very quick run through of different types of command control and signaling, uh, and I'll talk I'll talk briefly about what ETCS is for those uh, who aren't very familiar with the system. Those who aren't from Europe or Australasia may not have been exposed to this. And we've got quite a, a multinational crowd here today, thankfully. And um, we're going to and then I'll be talking about interfacing uh, multiple systems. And what I decided to do with this presentation was look at the two biggest installations we've got of ETCS in the UK so far. And those are the Thameslink and the Crossrail. And as you'll, when you see when I go into this, for those of you who don't know, those two are both very similar and also very different. And uh, the comparison between the two, the options that were available, the options that were chosen, and the integration challenges, they're for quite inter an interesting comparison. Uh, and I put the challenge out for, this is very much a, as far as I'm aware, several people have said they think this is the first time those two systems have been contrasted. Um, I'm not, this is not a very deep dive of them. Uh, but it just is some interesting thoughts that, uh, and I have put the challenge out that I, there might be some uh, uh, research papers in this that would be like, that I'd like to see. Uh, so we'll see, and we'll talk, we'll talk about that at the end. So I'll just briefly go over types of uh, CCS. Um, there is, a, generally I, I break them down into two types of main systems. Uh, conventional, which is what a lot of us are familiar with, is what is the interlock, interlock flight signals and usually they come with some form of train protection or automatic train protection. Uh, here in the UK, we use two systems uh, simultaneously uh, for train protection, which is what we call the train protection warning system and the automatic warning system. I won't go into too much of the detail of those, but needless to say, they consist of magnets in the track that are connected to the signal. The magnet is, is polarized one way or the other, depending on whether the signal is red or green, and the train approaches that, interprets that, and provides warning information to the driver and brake intervention if the driver doesn't do what they're supposed to do. But I won't go into the complexities of that in this presentation. The more advanced forms of uh, train control uh, CCS that I like to talk about uh, are all the new modern radio-based systems. And there are three main systems that we're quite really familiar with worldwide, although one of them is more a group of systems I'm aware. <laughs> I do apologize to uh, uh, our North American colleagues and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, First of all, though, we have communications-based train control, or CBTC, for Metro. Now, I know our colleagues in the IEEE have actually defined CBTC as any form of uh, 
train control system that uh, uses the where the movement authority is transmitted over a radio system. But I think most of us who've worked in metros worldwide um, acknowledge that CBTC is a, is a particular flavour of that. Has been the, the CBTC acronym has been sort of uh, hijacked by the metro world for as a particular flavour of those type of systems. One that consists of uh, automatic train operation as well as automatic train protection or automatic train supervision, which I'll talk in a moment. Uh, the European Rail Traffic Management System, or ERTMS, is a system that we're, which includes uh, the European Train Control System, which is the ETCS, which is what I'll be talking about, is uh, being uh, ma uh, is the main mainline system that's being uh, rolled out across Europe, including here in the UK. Although we uh, are no longer part of the European Union, we are still implementing this system. That system is also identical to the Chinese Train Control System, CTS, CC, CTCS, that the Chinese are rolling out. Uh, the only difference is that the levels are defined slightly differently, but it's basically exactly the same system. Uh, and finally, we have positive train control, which uh, is, of course, uh, more of a standard than a single system that was defined by the Congress in the United States uh, to uh, provide uh, common train protection across America. And I believe uh, a lot of our, Can uh, our Canadian colleagues are also implementing uh, these sort of systems. I know now that this is now being more standardized into a standard system. So I must confess, I haven't worked on it for a few years, so I'm sure Dale and others would uh, have more information on that. I won't talk about that too much uh, in this si seminar, but hopefully you'll be able to see anyone who is working on PTC, you'll see the uh, similarities with the ETCS system. Uh, there's additional systems that we have, certainly in the UK, uh, and uh, are used. I know certainly these are also used within uh, Europe. Uh, I'm sure they're used other, in, and certainly Australia and probably elsewhere. Um, but... Uh, we have traffic management systems uh, on the main line, and we also have driver advisory systems. Uh, I'll talk about those in a moment and how they relate and how they fill gaps in the main line system of ETCS that are provided in CBTC. Well, let's look at the from a system. We're all systems engineers, or probably most of us are. Uh, so what are the fundamental requirements of a CCS system? Well, I always say that there's three. Uh, first is that it's, the most important is to ensure the safety of the trains, that they don't bash into each other and they don't overrun points. But it's also to route the trains efficiently and also to optimise the performance of the individual trains. So if we look at how that's generally applied within a conventional system, we all have our line controller or signaller, whatever you like to call them. And we have our train operator or driver. And basically, we need to get information from this person to that person, but it needs to be correct and safe. So usually the line controller will, will work through some sort of control centre. I know here in the UK, we still have an old, a few old fashioned signal boxes but we're ripping all those out. So hopefully in the next year or two, we'll just have a nice centralized modern control centers. Excuse me, I'm so sorry. And generally a request is then made to the signaling system, which will obviously consist of the interlocking predominantly uh, that will be connected to, and connected to the ATP. And that will then pro provide the, move, the authorization to move to the train driver, usually through some sort of sig uh, fixed light signal. There is actually usually a bit of two-way communication between these different layers of levels, these functional layers. And also there is a direct community line of point of communication between the line control and the train operator. Uh, you, here in the UK, we use a system called GSM R Mobile, which is basically a, a dedicated railway band of GSM, of the GSM mobile band. Uh, not very great, as I'm sure most of you who've worked on it will know, but it's, uh, it is being upgraded. Uh, but we can define these, uh, if we look at these more as functional layers than uh, uh, system uh, rather than uh, particular locations or systems, we can make these into some general terms, which I like to call route control, safety and protection, and the train control. And surprise, surprise, this then now maps really nicely onto our three fundamental requirements. So uh, this is where all the safety is that ensures the safety of trains are safe. This is what's routing the trains efficiently, and this optimizes the train performance of the trains. We'll look at like functions that go in here. Generally, in this layer, we'll have things like the operator terminal, the control server, things like automatic train supervision and automatic route setting. And in these level, we'll have this is where our interlocking, our train detection, point of level crossing detection control are, and automatic train protection. And at the bottom here, we will have things like automatic train operation, driver machine interface, and driver assistance systems. So how do we, but then that is this, like I said, this model on the left is very much a functional model. And, uh, but it doesn't, in reality, we have to implement it. Generally, the physical model is much more like this one on the right. So we'll generally have locations such as control centers, 
equipment rooms that are distributed across the network. The trackside area within the forefoot of the rail, what we call the forefoot here in the UK, which is the distance between the two running rails, and the rolling stock itself. So how does this sort of mapping work? Well, in uh, if we look at like the traditional UK conventional system, we generally have some sort of operational control system that is then connected to the interlocking system. And the interlocking is connected generally to the TP our protection systems, as well as our signals, and of course our track circuits and points. So I haven't got points drawn on here. So if we look at how this fits in, I'll have something like the OCS is both relevant to both the route is the route control, the interlocking and the train detection, the TPWS AWS at the safety and protection, and the signals are part of the train control because they're just telling the driver uh, how to interpret uh, the data that's being produced by these systems. But if we look at how these are actually distributed physically, although the OCS is quite obvious, we can see that there is actually uh, the signals are actually in the trackside area. The interlocking is usually an equipment room. Train detection and TPWS are obviously in the trackside area. And we also have, an, also have a part of the TPWS on the rolling stock as well. Look at communications-based train control, which is uh, quite prevalent as something I'm going to talk about shortly in terms of the two applications in the UK. Uh, CBTC is, like I said, generally... Like I say, although CBTC is a generic term as defined by the IEEE, it's sort of been requested by the metro world to mean uh, a system that provides automatic train operation, automatic train protection, and automatic train supervision. Where um, automatic train protection is how the train is protected, is how the train is protected. The ATO is what drives the train to the near to the next uh, designated stopping point, so getting the train from station A to station B, etc. And the uh, ATS is, uh, is the automatic uh, uh, system that's in the control system software, which regulates the, uh, the entire network and tries to keep everything running. Generally, these systems can be implemented in one of two ways. We still have, there are still fixed box systems. The, the Victoria Line on uh, London Underground is a classic example of this. And it, you, it, the system's called distance to go. Um, generally with that one, you're still working as if there was a signal there, but it's, there's no need for a signal. And the train just drives to the braking curve uh, as defined as it receives from the track, the track circuit train detection. But of course, what everyone really wants to achieve is moving block, where we don't have any sort of train detection. We don't use track circuits or axle counters. Uh, but the system is a bit, but the train is, the system is just basically dividing the net track network into really small blocks just in a central ATP system. The train is somehow detected, usually using fixed. Uh, automatic position references in the track that the train then transmits back to the uh, ATP to see where it is and uses the odometry to work out how far it's gone, etc. So the central system is constantly updating to where every train is, and it tries to run all the trains as close together as possible without them being uh, causing any unsafe situations. Look how CBTC fits onto this sort of model. It's quite simple. Uh, the automatic train supervision is obviously the route control. The ATP is the safety and protection. The ATO is the train control. But again, a bit more complicated when we're implementing. ATS is still very much in the control center, but the ATP can be spread over all three of these layers, and the ATO is very off, is, of, is often a, a part of the rolling stock. Now then, uh, for those who aren't familiar with the European Rail Traffic Management System that's been implemented on the main lines here in the UK and throughout the rest of Europe, um, ERTMS is basically uh, a standard interoperable railway system that has been defined by the European Union uh, to try and uh, standardize all the train, all the operating rules and protection systems that are used throughout Europe. There's currently, I think it was the last count, it was something like 237 different forms of signaling and uh, real train operation rules are used across Europe. This is the aim to standardize all those into a single set of rules and a single system. The ERTMS, now people often confuse ERTMS and ETCS, but basically ERTMS is made up of three key components. Uh, the GSMR, which is the global system for mobile railways, which I mentioned earlier, which is a standard um, uh, wireless radio communication for railways. Uh, the European train control system, which is mentioned, rest of it a lot of ways, but it is basically interoperable train detection and uh, train movement control, basically. Uh, and then there is also a European traffic management layer, which is still not currently defined, unfortunately, but that will provide optimized traffic ma management and standard operating rules. To work, ETCS was designed as a ETCS was designed as a modular 
as a sort of system that can be built up over a series of levels. The first one that it defines is level one, where basically, and this was designed as like an overlay on existing uh, systems. And the way it works is you fit something called a line side encoder unit that connects to your signals. And that reads what the signal says. And then you place it in the, in the track, what we call Belize's. Now these are basically half an electromagnet that you can code um, with a particular um, value. And there's two types of them. One, some of them are fixed ones, which just basically say, this is me, I am here. So they are an absolute position reference, similar to what you get on CBTT systems. And the others can be switchable Belize's, which you use at level one, which the line side encoder unit says what uh, indication this signal is. And that will then, when the train goes over these ones that are connected to the line side encoder unit, the driver knows that the, what the signal is before they get to it. They have a display in the cab, what we call a drive machine interface or DMI. And they will know, and it tells them what speed they can be going to, whether they should be slowing down or whether they can carry on at full pelt. And then and obviously that provides some improvement in performance. However, it doesn't create a much difference from what we're using currently. The next stage is level two, which is what was currently trying to be rolled out across Europe and, uh, and including the UK. And with this one, is this is where you can finally go for signals away. Now, in order to do this, the interlocker, you still have an interlocking and you still use traditional train detection. So in other words, axle counters or track circuits, wherever your poison is. But all the Belize's now are just fixed. And they're just literally the absolute position references that tells you where the train is. And then the interlocking is also connected to something called a radio block center. Now, the one, and this is one, an official EU diagram, but I don't like it because the radio block center is not a building. <laughs> it is another, another piece of kit, basically. And what it does is it translates the interlocking info, uh, information into a movement authority that is transmitted over the GSMR network to the ETCS system on board the train. And now the driver will constantly be, and there's now constant communication to the driver, whereas level one is intermittent, this one is, con is continuous. And basically, as soon as the driver has an update to their movement authority, they receive it. And basically there's a little notch on the uh, speedometer on driver machine interfaces, interface, which constantly goes up and down, depending on how fast or what the movement authority is. And the driver has to work within, as to drive within that speed limit. There is another conceptual layer, although I say it's conceptual, the technology is there, but there's a problem which I'll get into in a minute, which is called level three. This is not being uh, widely rolled out yet, uh, but this is basically moving block because we now remove all the traditional uh, train detection. So now no axle counters, no track circuits, and also no interlocking. It's all done within, the interlocking functionality is now done within the radio block center. And basically every train is just trying, it has to update the radio block center of its position and uh, the, and basically it tries, just like on a, a moving box CVTC system, to run all the trains as close together as possible. Now, we have a problem in Europe. This, isn't, this might come as a surprise to a lot of our North American colleagues, where freight is a lot more, is a lot more powerful and uh, has a lot more, um, and goes over a lot more long distances. But um, in the UK and other countries within Europe, because our freight is... Um, goes over relatively short distances compared to yourselves um, we don't need to have very large fully into fully connected trains to move freight around and what we actually have is we just have dummy wagons that are just pulled by a powered locomotive the problem with those is you cannot guarantee that the, that the, the units remain complete basically because you haven't got any connections across the the, the, the sister the uh, the train therefore the Currently, things like axle counters and track circuits provide a secondary functionality in that they ensure that you can, they obviously allow the system to fail safe if you do have wagons becoming disconnected and the driver of the freight train doesn't notice, they will still be detected by the axle counters or track circuits, so the interlocking will prevent other trains to coming into the area where they are. Obviously, if we move to level three, we can't do that. So there's currently a way of currently looking into seeing if there's ways of doing it cheaper that we can ensure train integrity of freight trains for that purpose. So that's why we currently aren't widely rolling out level three across Europe, except on isolated lines that don't have freight running on them. That is, uh, so that's a basic overview of the ETCS system in its simplest form. Uh, there, it is, there are some other in levels. You can also count, we also call level zero when we have a train that is fitted with ETCS, 
but it's work running in a non-ETCS equipped area. And basically then um, you obviously have no movement authority transmitted, but you can still use the ETCS to limit the maximum speed of the train. So it can be used for like depot operations and so forth. There's other, also another, um, well, which is a, a, there's a level where you can use where you can have a, a, the ETCS acting as an interface for a local system where it goes to a special module, which I'll refer, which I'll be coming back to in a moment, called the specific transmission module, where you connect the old system on the train, sorry, you connect the old system to the specific transmission module or STM, it goes to the ETCS on the train, and the ETCS on the train just basically provides an output of that system as it's working on the, its equivalent infrastructure. Hopefully that'll make more sense in a minute when I talk about Thameslink. Like I say, though, there are another couple of supplementary systems which we are implementing in the UK, including on the two examples I'm using. Um, first is traffic management. Uh, one thing you'll have noticed on the uh, ERTMS specification, uh, especially since we haven't got ETML, there's no definition currently for the traffic management layer. Uh, but we have defined a series of traffic management rules and traffic management systems here in the UK, which are being implemented. And this is basically bringing AI for it into real uh, to automate things like route setting, and trying to speed up recovery for when things go wrong and trying to get us run as close to the timetable as possible. The other system is something that I don't know, I don't know how widely this is used outside of, but I know it's, excuse me, but I don't believe it's being implemented much on the main line in Europe, in, in, in mainland Europe. Uh, I do know the Australians have looked at this as well, but we have a, in the UK, we've been looking at a system called driver advisory system. And there's two flavors of this, what's called unconnected and connected. Now, um, this is basically trying to get the driver to drive as efficiently as possible, but unfortunately, but it's one that causes a bit of conflict between the operator and the infrastructure manager because they can use it. They can be used for two different things. The old unconnected systems generally took a, a download of the timetable at the start of their when they started their first journey, and then they try and advise the driver what would be the most fuel efficient way uh, to drive the train uh, based on the timetable. Of course, the timetable can change during the day, so then it becomes next to useless. So you then have connected, we've now got into a connected driver advisory system, which is basically in constant communication with the control center, and it gets updated as there are changes to the timetable. However, like I said, the train operators who implemented the other connected systems generally want to still use this to, for fuel efficiency uh, on lines they're still using diesel, whereas the network rail, the infrastructure manager, wants this to basically provide a consistency of driving style, which is what you get out of full automatic train operation. So in other words, you're trying to get the benefits of ATO through a connected DAS system, but still having the benefit of having a driver in the cab. Um, I believe that they asked, they're now implementing CDAS with that principle in mind, uh, but I don't think we've got a full system implemented yet. So I can't really give a comparison, though it is being used on several, uh, uh, networks and tra uh, uh, several lines and is being trialed. But that means that generally what we're looking at when we're putting a level in the UK, we try and fit an ETCS level two system with traffic management system and CDAS. Uh, as you can see, TMS is up here. The ETCS is basically the safety and protection and the DAS is down at the bottom here. But the ETCS is a bit of a complicated beast because it does have some elements which are more to do with train control than the safety and protection. So as you can see the distribution here, traffic management is generally in the control center. Equipment room is where we define the interlocking and radio block center. Train detection is, in, is still in the trackside area, as are the Belize's. The European vital computer, which is the brain of the onboard element, is on the train, obviously. But then we also have the driver advisory. We also have the um, driver machine interfaces, which is part of ETCS, as well as DAS. Now, I know you're probably thinking, Aren't these two conflicting, potentially conflicting uh, systems? Uh, they could be, but they are now trying to be integrated into a single interface so that they are working together. So let's have a look at the two implementations that we've been looking at here in the UK, and then I'll open up the floor for questions. But with Thameslink, for those who don't know, this is the Thameslink route that is on the UK. And the aim is to fit, uh, the aim was this section here, uh, I've highlighted is basically right through central London. And this is where we get the most trains running because there are several points here where we, uh, what, I, what I like to call injection points, uh, where we uh, feed additional trains in 
uh, to run parts of the route and so forth in order to make the uh, sorry that's my phone um, to to get as many to get the uh, massive the 24 trains per hour I think is what they want to achieve here uh, through central London to keep London moving now in order to do that the decision was made on Thameslink to fit ETCS on this line but also with an ATO box so this doesn't actually have so in this section, they're not actually using the driver. The train's going to be fully automated. Now, in order to do that, they use this system. They are looking now at improving, in, in improving this, which I'll, uh, but, but at the moment, the way it works is the traffic management system makes a request to the interlocking. The interlocking then makes the request to the RBC, but also as the traffic management system passes through the, passes through the here, it also passes through the ATO movement authority. And so the RBC pro provides, so there is almost a virtual link to the automatic train operation, not a direct one. And through this run, through something called Packet 44, which is a programmable uh, core, uh, or programmable part of ETCS that you can use for whatever you like, they're passing the, move, the ATO movement authority to the ATO from the EBC. My understanding is that they're now changing this so that this will now have a, the ATO will actually get its own dedicated radio link back, but at the moment it's working through this way. So, you have um, the ETCS and the ATO working in uh, together, so to speak. Now, on Thameslink, that means we've got a setup like this, which is very similar to the one I showed earlier. But basically, this is how it then fits on the train. Uh, you basically have, because the other thing is, outside of that central core area, the train has to work on the old TPWS AWS system. And this is where some of the complexity came in. And what the decision was made on uh, Thameslink was to use a specific transmission module connected to the European Vital Computer of, ET of the ETCS, and that the TPWS AWS would feed into that, and the, and the ETCS would still provide the interface for that, as well as managing the ATO. The challenges, for the, speaking to some of the people on this project, as well as some of my own experiences on it, um, there were significant challenges to, in the development of the specific transmission module. These need to be developed uh, bespoke for each country system. Since we never implemented this in the UK before, this was the first time this was implemented. There was a lot of teething problems. And all of the systems need to be integrated into the driver machine interface. That was not easy. Uh, and the driver machine interface is not the most programmable system. And using ATO over Packet 44, it's a bespoke system. It's not used, been used anywhere else. And um, Anything that's not standard off the shelf, we all know there's a lot of teething problems. And because there are certain limitations on the ETCS program that were built in for its use on um, uh, multi-mode mainline, that put limitations on the ATO. So optimizing this thing has been a nightmare. And I believe this, the optimization is still continuing at the moment. Crossrail. Uh, for those of you who weren't know, aware of Crossrail, this is the other program I'll look into. This is an east-west, whereas Thameslink was a north-south link in London, Thames Crossrail is an east-west link. And it's also one of the, the first brand new line that was uh, put in London, uh, in, well, in the UK for a long time. Now, it is using two parts of, connect, of existing line outside of London, this blue line here, and this, blue line, this one here, which leads up to Reading, which is actually quite near where I live, <laughs> if anyone's interested. And... Um, these pink bits were brand new lines that were built for this. Uh, one that was a connection to Heathrow, which was just gonna, was going to have ETCS level two on, and also this line, this these bits here, which is what was called the core, and this is all the bit that's running actually through central London. And this is, um, and th but this one they decided that with um, they would not get the outcome. The number of trains they went out here which is approaching i think 30 or 34 trains per hour they couldn't get that number through there with an etcs system with ato they didn't feel so they decided to go for a cbtc system through here however they still had to have etcs level two for this section on the trains and likewise they had to be able to use have tpws aws for these existing sections as well so three complicated systems that we have to include that had to be implemented together and the decision was made on this program to use a switching system. And what they did was on the train, there's a single driver interface, but then there is this system that's in the middle that basically has the TPWS, ETCS, and the CBTC all feeding into it. And it just has to work out which system is relevant based on uh, 
uh, special switching Belize's that it receives directly from the um, ETCS system uh, to know which system to switch on in any particular uh, in the particular locations. The challenges they faced on Crossrail were slightly different from uh, Thameslink. Uh, and they initially, all three systems were fitted completely in parallel and required manual switching by the driver when they were doing the testing phase. Uh, you can imagine how complicated and challenging that was. Uh, and the trains now automatically switch, but the main challenge was the complex software of the switching system. Went through a lot of iterations. They ended up having to build two dedicated test labs in order to run all the scenarios and get all the systems going together. There was also multiple supplies involved with uh, separate suppliers for the signaling system and the trains. Though thankfully they got the contracts working right and the uh, integration between those teams was pretty seamless and they worked together very well. Just to put some conclusions on this, for I'll just these are the ones I put in on the um, uh, on the challenge uh, from the uh, from the uh, convention I attended. Uh, it's very important to think systematically, and I'm sure all of us systems engineers appreciate that. Though parts of the railway are still a bit behind on this, uh, we need to choose the right solution for the right application, and you need to consider both the horizontal transitions and the vertical architecture. Uh, it's important of a systems integration review panel. Uh, this needs to be used as part of the assurance process and all issues should be signed off there. Um, you can't just do these things willy nilly that was found with both the programs when I conducted some interviews for this, uh, said that they needed to be able to, you needed this, this panel, a panel like this is essential. You need to take things in because everyone is working on their own little bit, as we know, we need to keep, we need a panel to keep looking, to be working cross sectionally across the whole system and the whole area, both vertically and horizontally, I'll say again, to make sure everything um, is working together. And it's also important to test everything and in every scenario, test offline, test online, test everything, test in simulators, test on, test on the trains. That's all I'm going to speak about, but I'm happy to take uh, any questions if anyone the this. And Dale, I see you've got one in straight away. <laughs> Hey, Carl. Yeah. yeah, just wondering the level of uh, modeling and simulation, both both Thameslink and Crossrail, if they if they went down that road or did they just try to work on decent requirements or? Yes, they both. It's an interesting question. Um, as far as I'm aware, if anyone else who's, who's on Thameslink and Crossrail has anything to uh, would like, uh, please, please do uh, add, but I think I would say um, it's got to be careful with what it depends on the definition of modeling. I've got to be careful here because the definition of modeling and simulation is probably quite important. I don't believe there was a lot of complex, fully computer based modeling, if you know what I mean, done. There was some simulation done, but both of them made more use of uh, integration test labs, which used real equipment. Um, and some level of and like a, a software simulator on top of that, if that makes sense, Dale. Yeah, um, thanks. Yep. There was a um, there was a Thameslink, and both of those and all of those labs have actually been continued um, on uh, these uh, on the on uh, and are still in use at the moment. Thameslink have got theirs at uh, uh, London Bridge. Uh, I think we've uh, here and in Corsi Rig we've taken a few. Uh, Two of visits to there, and I know there's another one uh, we're trying to set up uh, in the new year. Uh, but obviously, we've not been able to take any off the last couple of years due to COVID. Uh, and there is also two uh, dedicated labs for Crossrail: uh, one that's still based in London, uh, around Canary Wharf, and the other, which is at uh, Siemens' uh, main uh, uh, manufacturing site here in the UK, which is based in uh, and R&D lab, which is based in Chippenham. Uh, and uh, both of those, are all of those are still being used with all the modifications and upgrades that are being uh, made at the moment. Uh, but there are, um, uh, but uh, in terms of pure computer-based modeling at the start of the program, I don't feel, I, I, I might be biased, I didn't see that happen. I'm not saying it didn't. I might, I might not have been privy to it, but I think that was an opportunity missed personally. And I think there has been some feedback there. Because I know both both programs have said what they would have liked to have done is done more modeling and more simulation earlier, certainly. Great. Thank, thanks, Carl. No worries at all, Dale. Thank you. Um, 
Do you have any other questions? Anyone want to put the hand up or just shout out or whatever? If we have anything, we have you answer anything. I know uh, Sanji has put some interesting things in there. Sorry, Mike, is that you saying that? Yeah, I was just saying, sounds very good. If there's others that, that um, want to comment, please do it um, uh, right to Carl right, right now. We want to get on to Dale and let him uh, go on his update. We have about 15 minutes left. But, yeah, that's uh, yeah. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. And uh, the world of digital that. twins is coming around. Is, is that going to affect how things go, huh? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, there's more of it. And, and also, I'll, I'll plug something else here as well, which is enterprise modeling and enterprise architecture for who hasn't heard of it. Um, that's coming as well, which hopefully I'll get someone to do a presentation on that in the next year or so, if anyone's interested in that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, definitely, Mike, uh, digital twins are going to be... Uh, big game changer thank you okay dale it's all yours to go uh where are we and uh where would you like to go and where can we help <laughs> yeah thanks thanks mike and and thanks carl that was that was great that was good good explanation and good comparison too um can you guys see my screen yep i, I hope <laughs> okay all right, I'm going to go fairly quick. Um, I was going to, we're, we're going to kind of try to do this more interactive kind of workshop, but maybe we'll save that for, for IW or for, or for next month. So I'll just give you a quick update and, um, and then we can, we're recording this anyway. So even if I go quick, you can throw feedback at, uh, at uh, me. So we'll just do it that way. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, why does why does this whole life cycle thing matter for assets and projects and and how do we use it? I think most of the folks uh, scanning down the attendees uh, don't we don't need to spend a lot of time on this. There's some comparative life cycles just for your reading enjoyment and and every every project uh, you know has its own special uh, derivation of these. But the point uh, trying to make with this discussion and where it's going to as far as the APTA and COSI um, SLE standard is that these early you know these early activities uh, there's a significant number of things that are supposed to happen and um the problem that that we've observed is that you know because they're pre-designed nobody cares if it's just to be super blunt in a lot of ways um that's maybe more so I'll speak geographically perhaps that's more of a a US Canada issue I don't know um, but that's been my observation in a number of very, very large multi-billion dollar projects I've been involved in recently, you know, the last decade is that this early stuff just kind of either gets glossed over or or we just don't do a, a, a super thorough job of it. Uh, you know, small things like identifying stakeholder needs. Um, yeah, so oh, I forgot we had the peekaboo thing going on here. So, yeah, so a lot of the projects that, you know... <laughs> Uh, it seems like they, you know, the the early things that are happening on, on the life cycle get compressed to just a few months if you're lucky, and then the projects kind of start at you know the CDR gate where you you know you're just jumping right into design, um, and the characteristics are that uh, you know project teams are mobilized based on well it's kind of the same as the last project so not a big deal minimal effort is expended there's probably and 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 you know I know for a fact there's not much money put in these early life cycle activities. Uh, there's dozens of process planning documents that are, you know, usually due at NTP plus 30 or 60. And they, these generally become shelfware. Um, there's not, as I mentioned earlier, there's not a lot of budget for this stuff. And, um, you know, I haven't, I haven't observed yet that, you know, uh, where, where you go into a project and there's this assumption that things that are sort of foundational, like uh, configuration management and document control, are operational. And I, I just haven't experienced that yet. Um, so that's that's another issue. But uh, so right out of uh, right of out of Encozy, and uh, this is a great. I don't know if they repeated this in version four and if it's going to stick around in version five of the handbook. But I love this uh, this excerpt. You know where the uh, you know, it, it actually made it into the handbook where they talk about projects driven by eager project champions, get on with it, you know, and that's exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, let's just get on with it. We've got bills to pay and uh, and milestone gates to to get through. So so it's, it was good to see that that was actually in the in the handbook. 
So we're proposing four early life cycle phases to start off the system's uh, life cycle uh, standard. And again, this is all conceptual stuff, so please feel free to comment. I was going to make this more interactive, but we've only got uh, nine minutes or something left, so I'll, I'll go quickly, and then you guys can all throw rocks at it and make suggestions and stuff later on in your spare time. Um, and or at IW or at some of the other monthly meetings that we're going to start holding that are going to focus on this standard and, and try to get some authoring done. So the business planning is where you get your agency goals, you know, mission goals, objectives. You're looking at regional and state goals, maybe tax measures. You're trying to build a business case. You're trying to understand what your capital program is going to look like and what the budget's going to be like. And then once you get into a set of potential candidate projects, then the candidate projects need to come up with a charter, work breakdown structure at some level, some kind of stakeholder planning, project organization, um, and the infrastructure to go along with it. And then, of course, last, well, not last, but the next is, is procurement. And that needs to start much earlier than it seems to start these days. Um, and there's no, there needs to be systems engineering uh, involvement in the design of the procurement, not, not kind of over the wall you know, while the procurement guy, procurement and legal are done with it here, here engineers, you know, good luck and that sort of thing. So we're, we're trying to get involved much earlier. And then mobilization, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's, it's really, you know, NTP plus 30, here's your 17 uh, plans and, uh, and off you go. So, um, and of course you need control gates. Otherwise you don't have any discipline. Uh, people are people and they'll, they'll try to get away with what they can get away with. So they, we need to respect the gate process too. We, we shouldn't be trying to rush our way, you know, gate crash through it. So the current observations, you know, lack of con ops uh, or not well done con ops if they're there, goals and objectives aren't really fully defined. Um, and then timescales to do all this front end stuff, really, you know, the, the budgets are just constraining that effort. Um, so what are we gonna try to do about it? So here's the concept, whoops, sorry. We're going to take those four, unless somebody comes up with a better idea. And again, this is all conceptual, so lots of ideas are, are welcome. Uh, look at four initial phases before we get to the actual project itself, um, with the business planning being uh, supported by systems thinking, project planning, same thing, and, and so on. So, And where we would have to work from a practical standpoint within APTA and transit agency folks is you know these are the groups we have to work with. This is part of the stakeholder engagement, where you need to work with you know uh, PMO if you're going to start talking about project planning phases and control gates for what you know what they do because that's their turf turf as it were. Same with procurement, and I, I'll talk at the end how we've already started that process with APTA. Again, PMO is involved and in, often in the mobilization, but could be HR too. I didn't put them on here, but depending on what you know, the scope of your project and if you got to move people around and that sort of thing. So there's multiple agency uh, disciplines that need to get involved, departments, and we want to make sure that we're incorporating as much of the existing APTA uh, thinking on this as we go forward so that we're harmonized in our, in our approach to this. So what would be some planning requirements? These are not well-written requirements. Um, they're just more need statements, you know, so this is the kind of stuff that we'll refine and, and do a better job of going forward, but it's just to get some thoughts on paper at the concept level. So first of all, identify who the stakeholders are um, and actually nail down in, 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 you know, solid words, the mission, the goals and objectives. And those probably change every year, maybe every six months, but at the very least every year, they should be reviewed and renewed and, and actually agreed by folks. Um, and, you know, one of the stakeholders in that would, of course, be, you know, if it's a federally, uh, if there's federal oversight involved, then that would be part of it, um, governance. But then there's the, the patrons, the riding public. You know, you need to get some buy-in from them, too, if that is the goal for the, your, your agency. Um, and then you need to identify risk and scoring and capital project candidates need to be prioritized based on needs and, and risk assessment. So here was an example of some, you know, some actual deliverables that you might need to specify um, if you're sort of exploring, you're sort of in the brainstorming phase, for instance, of the exploratory part of the business planning where you're looking at mission goals, objectives, candidate ideas, 
uh, what are the mega trends that are happening, you know, security, safety, uh, COVID, you know, all the things that are changing in our world um, and, you know, using risks and formal methods to help to help organize those thoughts. Then you you start doing a reduction of all that exploratory brainstorming and, and try to get into um, you know where you're going to end up with uh, as far as a candidate set of projects where basically how are you going to spend your money which gets you into the concept uh, business case and so on so these this is the again this is all conceptual level just trying to generate a conversation and then the second uh, you know phase would be project infrastructure uh, or sorry project planning. So the agency plans uh, get provided to the suppliers as a set of requirements well before RFP. In fact, we're actually stock talking about things like a, a supplier a vendor surveillance or vendor um, database in advance for, for the agencies. And so that you're not doing all this on the fly or after the fact or reinventing it for every project, which we sort of seem to do with these massive, massive uh, RFPs that go out that that shouldn't be necessary. Other companies like General Motors and Boeing have figured out better ways to do it, and we we you know we need to try to incorporate some of those those good ideas. Um, without going into too much detail, same kind of a concept where you've got some you know some deliverables that allow you to get through the control gates, and and you know the deliverables are at varying levels of maturity and acceptance, um, and you define all that, and and you know that sort of decides whether you pass through the gate or not, and whether you get to spend more money or not on a given project. Um, and then there's, you know, there's, this is sort of breaking into some of the foundational process that I mentioned earlier that folks often assume are working, but I haven't seen it yet, you know, especially document, you know, stuff that, that people take for granted, like document control and configuration management. It's not consistent and it's not well-defined and it's usually ad hoc and you got to figure it out in 30 days after you win the job. Um, how am I doing for time? Okay, I got 90 seconds, so I have to go really fast here. <laughs> anyway, so hopefully folks are getting the idea that we're trying to, to put down some requirements for each of these phases, try to try to put down some rules that that and, and some things that you need to achieve before you pass through those gates. And this is all done way in advance of actual uh, you know, project work. This this is this stuff is needs to be done up front so that you've got things ready for, for deployment, like tools and training packages. Uh, so project planning phase, that includes things like what's your org chart for the project going to be like? Are you going to do ad hoc, same as same as the last project, except or are you going to try to be a little bit more um, balanced in, in the organizational design so that you don't get these ri ridiculous conflicts of interest that I see or or the wrong people making the, the technical decisions? So we've got some thoughts on that that we can go through. Um so, and then procurement design. So design of the actual procurement, we're working closely with the uh, APTA procurement, technical procurement working group is the name of the organization. They're a subcommittee or sub working group of, uh, of APTA and we're helping them write a more modern uh, procurement specification from APTA guidelines. So, and we will try to incorporate all of our thoughts in there as much as we can, as far as system thinking goes, so that we get a harmonized approach. And I think, yeah, I don't have time to go through in, in, in it, this in a lot of detail. Uh, mobilization is the, is the last uh, of the four phases and mentioned it briefly already, but by the time you get to mobile, it, uh, mobilization, you know, you should, you should have a con, con ops that's validated. You should have some validate stakeholder requirements. You got to be talking about the tools well, you know, before NTP, because if you talk about them after NTP, then you're chewing up project time and probably rushing it. And, you know, it, it takes a lot of work to put the tools together and to integrate them, especially if you're trying to in integrate requirements management, configuration management and documents and, and, you know, the whole, really the whole information management uh, concept. So that's, it um sorry for rushing um and we can open it up briefly to some questions and comments um i'll just uh i'll just leave it at the the titles or the uh, four there it is sorry yeah there's so there's the basic comment con, blah, sorry concept where you've got these four preliminary phases 
before you get to the more traditional phases of, of the project startup at NDP? Because coming out of mobilization, you're basically at notice to proceed and the project starts. So that's it for me. I'll just leave it open. I can't see the anything else but my screen right now. So, <laughs> Okay. Well, let's thank Dale for covering that. He's been uh, working on this standard for some time, getting it together, and it's been a featured in the IW, and I assume it will also be done again there as well. Yeah, that's the hope is to do some actual work work on this since the international workshop is supposed to actually be a workshop event. That's why there aren't too many, you know, there isn't a lot of presentation. Well, there are presentations, but it's really meant to be more of a working uh, a working session for uh, for Nkozi, you know, members. Is Devin still online? Did, would she like to comment on uh, APTA and, uh, and what you're doing here briefly? I don't think she's still on. Mike, I okay. think she seems to have dropped off somehow. Um, right. If I could just say, Dale, though, um, uh, with your comment at the start, uh, I can promise you it is not exclusively to North America. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I suppose Mike and I have quite a few people on the call can attest for you. <laughs> it's not you. It's a, yeah, it's a very universal issue. Certainly, we have that problem. The stakeholder, lack of stakeholder engagement, particularly resonated with me. Uh, and a lot of this early stage stuff, yeah, and probably for the same reasons as well. Um, we, I mean, certainly here in the UK, I don't know if it feels the same in the US, but we have a very problem. That basically, it's any if we get anything sort of planning that goes that's anything longer than four years, for obvious reasons, we're quite lucky. We're quite lucky, really. Most of our um, decisions that come from the powers that be that pay for the railways, obviously. Uh, just want to see the short term for you again, so they will get their, they will retain their jobs. <laughs> yeah, no, that. There you yeah, go. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully, the, with this this uh, standard, if it becomes the standard, but in the, in the beginning, best practice set of best practices guides will do is it'll help the agencies um, who don't have the time or money to do all this on their own anyway. Um, you know, it'll help them through at least these early phases so they can be thinking about this as they as they run their businesses, as it were, mm -hmm. um, you know, and they don't have to jam this kind of stuff into the front of every project. Plus, you know, when they do it in every project, that's not really uh, a lean way to operate a business. You know, ideally, um, you know, you just you do it once. And, and, you know, rinse and repeat and then just review the processes and, and make them better each year. But you're not like reinventing them every project or asking a consultant to come in and reinvent them for you every project, you know, and that that kind of inefficient thing. So that's that's the goal here. Yeah. Dale, are you finding that uh, many agencies, transit agencies have some sort of PMO office or um an organization that works within the business planning you, you mentioned the cpm sip or eam do those organizations exist in a way that is functional uh or do some are still trying to organize some are still trying to organize but uh, the best um forgive the pun traction that we've had so far is uh with the procurement group um, ah, right we want to pull legal into this discussion because you know, the whole concept of crisp, uh, well-written requirements should be, well, it, dep it depends how cynical you are. It should be, uh, you know, music to uh, you know, a lawyer's ears. Yeah. yeah. Or <laughs> if they're looking for more billable hours, you know, maybe they don't want them to be so crisp. Maybe fuzzy is better. <laughs> but that's a cynical view. Um, yeah. So yeah, there there seems to be some real real solid interest, and in they're very much soliciting our help from the SE subcommittee mm -hmm. to help re redo the procurement um, approaches. You know, things like early supplier engagement, prototype projects. Um, you don't get to you don't even get to bid on a project for an agency unless you're in their in their vendor registry, which which mm -hmm. is which is going to mean a whole bunch of things are going to you know going to be a little different. Um, a lot of these ideas aren't new, though. I mean, they've been they've been done in procurement groups for large companies. And I mentioned General Motors because I was on the vendor surveillance team at General Motors for a couple of years. So, I mean, th this isn't new stuff. Um, 
It's just applying it to an industry that traditionally hasn't done that kind of thing up front. Um, and, it, you know, obviously it'll take take years to, you know, to build build this up and uh, and the suppliers in our industry might not might not appreciate it, but they should understand it because they've had to probably deal with it in in past projects or past lives, maybe. OK, let's uh, see if there's any questions from anybody. I, I know we're five minutes over, uh, but I just want to make sure everyone's had a chance. Uh, we've got still 11 people online. Anybody, any questions? Oliver, Marcel, Sanjeev, Wendy, Haiping, um, Kam Kamara. Yeah, I, I just had uh, sort of observations uh, to uh, echo Carl's experience as well. Um, so uh, the, as the slides flip past to my, my backgrounds uh, mainly uh, safety, systems, reliability, uh, resilience, that sort of thing. Um, and I would say from the major rail projects I've been involved with, you know, you mentioned the uh, the RACI or some people call it RACI matrix. Um, yep. uh, that That is, is really important for the approvals process on projects. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, just sort of emphasis on the, uh, the RACI matrix there and also definition of stage gates you mentioned stage gates and I think the earlier that stage gates can be defined the smoother the project runs um, and someone else just mentioned about getting requirements management in early you know getting getting requirements engineering getting going and um, that's that's also um, yeah a good thing to get that to get that in early even at a high level you know to get those get those top level requirements on the project as early as as early as you can to integrate with the you know for the systems integration systems functionality and to integrate that into the project management life cycle and get the get the project management team on board with with those requirements as well because particularly on complicated uh, you know complicated projects and also as systems are becoming more digitalized these days uh, the complexity of of projects and the demonstration of assurance is becoming more complicated so again that that, that also feeds back into the racky uh, as well so yeah, it's just a few observations really that I noticed as the slides were going through. But otherwise, yeah, I, I yeah, it looks it it looks fine. It looks yeah, it looks fairly typical. So uh, yeah, good stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Okay. Yeah, uh, my hit. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that why can't we have a, another session on this uh, life cycle kind of a thing where we can think about more about getting the conceptual design right before we actually kickstart the project. I think Dale would, would be happy to give another presentation if he doesn't mind, because we mm. have not had a, much of a chance because as per the statistics, I think majority of the roadway projects are under laws. We don't get the definitions correct. We don't get the architecture correct. And at the same time, we seem to be thinking that we can get the, I've seen the uh, West Coast Route Modernization Project right fail mm -hmm. right in front of my eyes because people did not know how to write a safety case at yeah. the conceptual level. Yeah. And uh, sorry, Carl, I think we don't have any single example of it successful ETCS in the UK railway, even after 20 years. We haven't learned any lessons from the the West Coast Road modernization failure. We have not learned lessons from the Cambrian failure. So I think getting all this information into the conceptual stage so that we don't repeat them, I think Dale has got a big job in front of him. And I think we need to have another session at least for an hour or two to actually see what can be done about the standardization of the conceptual stage, you know? Mm -hmm. Because I also worked in big companies. I worked at Alstom, I worked at Network Rail, and I worked at RSSB. And what these experiences tell me is the bosses make the decision without having a clue as to what they're doing, like Boeing exactly did 
you know, MCAS system. They put in the MCAS system and they had 20 billion dollars as a loss and three, loss of 346 lives. So all these decisions actually, I think if you read the latest insight, there is a Incose fellow who's actually complaining about that we, uh, we system engineers are lacking something. Mm. Well, that's yeah, a good topic. And, and uh, looks, looks like you try to address at least key points here, Dale, in your- Yeah. Your yeah, my hope, my hope is that we're going to, you're going to see a notice. <laughs> Once we figure <laughs> out how to use the, uh, the, email, the email list server properly, so apologies to everybody for the lateness of, of getting stuff out, but- um we we just have to get that sorted out with be, between both Incosi and Aptisides um to get these mailings out earlier but once we do get that figured out in the new year um and we will I promise do it by by the time of IW uh we will um be set setting up a series of I, I'm going to say two hours for now two hour workshops and these will truly be working working sessions just once a month once a month two hours um and uh, or maybe we'll split it into two one hour ones but you know we can we can talk about that at iw whichever makes the most sense sometimes less meetings are better though uh and uh and just really work on on these first four sections and invite folks from you know for instance from procurement and from legal to make sure we're getting the buy-in at the very beginning basically you know using a bootstrap method using using the methods of stakeholder engagement and systems thinking to pull in the right the right folks at the right time for the discussion, so that it's not just a bunch of you know systems engineers sitting around talking about this. We make sure that procurement and legal are happy and PMO is happy, kind of thing. So uh, that is the intent. is Is 2023? I uh, made a commitment to the APTA board that we would have a draft of some of these sections ready, uh, which is a lot, uh, especially since we've all got day jobs. So, so yeah, thanks. That's good. Good in, input. Uh, appreciate that. And we're, we're definitely that, that is our plan. So thank if you're you, interested, Dave. sorry. I was going to say, thank you, Dale. Already 12 minutes after. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah. And we can, uh, no, <laughs> well, no, it was good. It's good discussion. Yeah. I'm sorry as well. I, I should have bashed through mine a bit quicker. I'll cut back because I know we were, we were a bit late. Stan. Sorry about that, Dale. I do apologize. Oh, no, no worries, Carl. It's yeah. We just, we just got to figure out some of our uh, logistical uh, uh, operational concerns. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, like, okay. like how to like how to start a Zoom meeting. How many engineers does it take to start a Zoom Sorry, meeting? Zoom. Apparently, it, apparently, it takes seven. You so. got to have the right passwords. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right yeah. yeah. Hey guys. Hey, thank you very much, and thank you everybody for attending. And I'll stop the recording right now. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Dale. Thanks okay. all. Thank you. Thank you.